when you go out in your peers, you should be not subjugating your individuality to your peers, because that's not exactly right. That's kind of based on an inhibition model. You've got aggression, you've got bad habits, they have to be inhibited. You learn that by interacting with your peers. It's not the right model. What should happen is, let's say with your aggression, and hopefully you have some, is that it gets socialized. You learn how to play games, but you don't drop your drive to win. You integrate that in the games. And so you try to win, you try to play hard, but if you're defeated or you hit something negative, you don't respond negatively. And you can keep that all bounded within being a fair, a, a good player. And that means what's happened is you've learned how to play a game or a set of games that also includes the darker parts of you and they actually become part of your force of character. It's way better if you can pull that off and that's what you definitely want to do as an adult. Like all you people are going to have to learn to negotiate on your own behalf and that's really hard. It means that you have to know what you want. You have to be able to communicate it and you have to be able to say no. And to say no, you have to be built on a solid foundation. You have to have options. You got to remember that as you go through your life. If you don't have options, you can't negotiate with someone. And if you're not willing to use them, they win, period. Because if you're asking your boss for more money, say, the answer is no, because he doesn't have any spare money lying around that he can just give to you. And lots of other people are asking. So some of that zero sum stuff, not all of it, because often you cooperate with people and the whole pot can grow, but some of it's zero sum. And so you better have a case made. Here's how much money I should have. Here's why. Here's the benefit to you that will accrue if you do it. Here's the consequences that you don't. They're actually real. They will cost you and I will do them. Then you can negotiate. And you don't do that rudely. But those arguments, you better have them in order. If you're gonna negotiate for a raise or a status shift, you better have your resume at hand, all polished up and know where else you're gonna look for a job and you better be able to get one because otherwise you're weak and you will not win the negotiation. And if you're too agreeable, so you're conflict avoidant, you will make less money across time. That's already been well established. And that's because you don't have teeth, not enough. And so in the little micro contests that you're going to have every day, you're going to incrementally lose to people who are more aggressive, who have bigger teeth. And that's what happens. Don't let that happen. You Place yourself so you can negotiate, because otherwise you're just a facade. And in a real battle, a facade is just torn down right away. So the idea that the conscience isn't omniscient, even though it has that voice of, let's say, common sense, and that fits very nicely in with the Freudian idea of the superego, again, because the superego can be flawed, it can be too harsh, it cannot be, it cannot be properly developed. You see that often with people who are orderly. So their high conscientiousness fragments into industriousness and orderliness. Orderly people like willpower. They're very judgmental and they like things to be exactly where they're supposed to be, but they're also very self-punitive. So conservatives are much more likely to be orderly, by the way. It's one of the best predictors of conservative. Low openness is the best predictor, but right after that is high orderliness. So you can imagine when a kid goes to school, and shows some independence, that's actually gonna... People are gonna notice that. His peers are gonna notice that, the teachers are gonna notice that. Maybe it's too much independence even. It is a remarkable thing too, like, it's so interesting, you know, you can see marked signs of independence in children, well, right from the time they're born, basically, because what's one of the things that's really funny about infants is that, you know, when they're crying, you always think, oh, the baby's, well, you're crying, it's, baby sad. It's like, no, <laughs> a lot of the time that baby is angry. And the way that we know that is because you could do facial expression coding on infants, just like on, on adults, and you can tell what emotion they're expressing. And very frequently, like when the kid starts to recognize his mom explicitly, because he or she knows the smell right away, pretty much in the sound of the voice. But visually, if someone who comes in and it isn't who the baby wants, so generally, it isn't mom, the baby will start to cry. But it's not because the baby's sad, generally, it's because it's angry that mom didn't show up. And that's an early sign of will. This kid wants things, like, and it's perfectly willing to tell you about that. 